Hello, this is Gary Garrett, and this is part two in the video series of how to draw complex anatomical forms simply and get the proportions and foreshortening right. So a couple of things to keep in mind as we start this video is, number one, I've underexposed the film a little bit so you can see the lines and see the subtlety of some of the lines. It may look a little dark, but I'd rather have that than go a little bit more high contrast where the paper looks white and it burns out all of the information. Another point to keep in mind is I've sped up the film a little bit. Uh, the reason for that is is that it's similar to the process that I've showed in previous videos. And again, uh, the main points show up and don't get lost in the process. As I roll through this, I'm making sure my design and my gesture and my planning all works together. And I'm using the photograph just as a reference, uh, but not copying it. Uh, so you can see I'm changing the chair a little bit, made it sort of more of a standard chair rather than the one that's in the photograph. Uh, I'm kind of pushing the back end a little bit more so it foreshortens a bit. Uh, I'm trying to do a good representation of but at the same time I'm not becoming a slave to the image. One part of my design you may see that uh, I'm making sure that I keep real good track of is where the landmarks are. So you can see the trochanter which is on the side of the hip, uh, the box for the pelvis, the kind of egg shape for the rib cage. Uh, even the elbows and the sides of the knees, I'm making sure all those landmarks kind of line up. And then as I put the axis lines in, it shows me sort of the lateral uh, distances between things. Uh, it, again, I'm looking, beginning to look at it as volume of having a top plane and side planes. And as you might see, I'm making all of those linear measurements and lining everything up so I can build it up more, feel a little bit more confident about my design. Now that I'm a little bit more confident about my design and where things are, you can see the measuring there, I bring in the larger measurements where I'm using the stick, these plumb lines, these verticals, so I can line that up in relationship to the chair, in relationship to the width to the height, and then go to the diagonals. And again, if it's a 45 degree angle or an 85 degree angle or a 30 degree angle, and check that again to make sure my proportions are all rocking pretty well. As you might notice, those uh, measurements aren't random. I'm light lining everything up, getting it linked together. All these lines are important because you want to make sure stuff lines up. So if you look at the angle side between the elbow and the foot, the knee hits in the right place. If you notice the vertical in between the trochanter on the left leg, the ankle and the kneecap line up. So this is how you're going back in in a very non-objective way and just measuring everything out to make sure your design is rocking and your proportions are cool. You may also notice that it, as you bring these points up, it forms uh, shapes like triangles and boxes. And that's a really good way to use that shape design to, again, help judge the proportions of your figure. So now that the uh, basic proportions are sort of built up pretty well, I'm going to go in and start to build up some rudimentary form in it, right? Just that rib cage and that pelvis. Make sure I start to get the overlaps, get spatial clues about how the figure's leaning over. And you can see those overlapping points, like where the rib cage hits the pelvis or where the shoulder goes over the top of the rib cage, are really important. So in that diagram from Michael Hampton on the left, you can see those like basic large egg forms and the box form for the pelvis, and also that latissimus dorsi spread, those kind of bat wings that go up to the shoulder. That's gonna go in later, but again, you can see the space and the overlaps as I put it together. I'm just trying to secure the design and get everything kind of built up enough where I can see the top planes and the side planes before I move on to the next objective. At this point now I'm starting to lock in these angles and that's going to be very important because now I'm going to start to think about putting form on it and what direction the form is going. And You can see like where the rib cage is there's a certain amount of opening in it that's going to tell the viewer how far that form is tilting down in space or tilting up or coming at you or going away from you. But the good thing is at this point you're not locked down to your design so it's easy to move things around. You're just trying to get the general idea so you can execute on it later. One of the good things about this technique is since it's non-objective and since you're not really drawing arms and legs at this point, just plotting them out, uh, it makes it a lot less nervous and fear-inducing, right? It sort of takes the freak out factor out of it and it's really easily to change. So at this point in the diagram to the left you can see the schematical set of scapulas that I'm putting into the back and how much I'm changing them. Now in this new diagram I'm sort of leaning them over a little bit more but I'm not rendering them out, I'm not copying them, what I'm doing is simplifying at this point and then even taking that shoulder uh, capsule, the 
where the deltoid and the other muscles in the scapula come together and just making them a big ball to get the idea of the volume at this point. Another good technique is if you do a little details like the shoulder, kneecaps, or just pieces, go out to the big design again. So I'm going into the chair, sort of redoubling up my measurements, checking things out, um, sort of a very innocuous, uh, simple little chair there. And then I'm going to go into the head a little bit. Notice I didn't say the face, I said the head. Again, just kind of building that up. It's not really a super important part of this uh, design, but I love drawing heads, so I'm just going to go in and draw the head a little bit. This just becomes a little mental vacation for me. So it sort of takes the anatomy out and takes the uh, measurements out. It's just something I enjoy to put into a drawing. Sometimes I think to myself, if some parts aren't enjoyable, then why do it? So the structure is important, but also letting your interest vary a little bit as well. So I'm just going to shut up here for a moment and draw. So at this point, I'm going to punch up the shoulder, right? I'm building up the line quality. You notice most of the time it's not just one solid line. I'm building line after line after line. And the darker lines where this form is coming to the surface, where the skeleton or the bone is sort of reaching up and showing more of a plane break, sort of more of a little bit more of a contrast. And then laying the rib cage underneath it just so my landmarks are correct in their placement. It's also important at this point that you realize in this process you let your brain shift and back and forth between different problem solving devices. So if you notice the diagram on the left, yes that's the shoulder with the muscle, but I'm turning into a simple ball and then connecting that in with the scapula and connecting in with the arm so there's like one unified form and again I'm getting set up to make it a lot more volumetric. As I build this up, watch for the diffuse line around the edge of the uh, plane of the rib cage and the scapula show that it's a rounder, more pliable form. You may also notice a change in the line quality from the diagram. The diagram's dark, there's some really hard lines on it. You notice that since the form is sort of softer, more rounded, I'm keeping the lines more diffused. So now I'm getting really confident about where everything is and what the proportions are. So those little dots are where the form is going to connect in with the body. And that's where the axis lines come in. Those axis lines keep things lined up so they become symmetrical. So you can see how one side works in relationship to the other. And to make sure that those points of reference for your proportions will work. Now if you make a comparison between the drawing and the diagram, you'll see that a lot of those points are where the shadow pattern changes. Remember where the planes and the angles change is also where the light changes. So as I move to the legs, you can see the same methodology happening. Again, with this bones coming to the surface, with skeletons coming to the surface, some sort of hitting on a little bit more, especially the inside corners. Perhaps you can see where the primary light is coming down from above and where you get the core shadow on the side of the leg, sort of the inside corner, and then there's that bounce light coming up underneath the leg and showing up. You might also notice that those large ch plane changes uh, help define the three-dimensionality of the form a lot more. So the lit plane on top, maybe the core shadow in the middle, and the bounce light underneath starts to turn that form a lot more. So I'm moving in close up to the knee, and you might notice that uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm sort of playing with the form. I'm not quite certain where everything goes. So it started out with sort of a ball, I'm turning into a box, and there's a, a uh, cylinder, and that diagram to the left shows you all that complex form simplified out into simple tubes. Now I may not be certain exactly what I want to do with the kneecap, but I do know I have the proportions right. So again, those little reference dots come out to show where stuff is going to attach later and so to be able to pull in my proportions right. Just literally like sort of an organic connect the dots but not with such a hard line. So 
At this point, I'm going to rock on the feet a little bit more, taking those real basic triangles that I started off with to get the proportions, the height and width of the foot, and then just sort of organicize them a little bit, put a little curves in it, get the Achilles tendon in there, get the overlap of the heel, and then move into the foot that's on the ground, uh, sort of structuralizing it a little bit more. You can see again, hitting up the, building up the ankle, there's the Achilles tendon, there's a the calcaneus bone, that block in the back. Again, I just don't want to draw this floppy clown foot. I actually want to draw something that has three-dimensional space to it that goes back in space, back in depth. All right, so now as we move back to the leg, I'm taking those dots and sort of connecting them. If you notice, I'm really not gonna to try to draw the legs. I'm gonna be very light, just do some light sort of angle sides. Again, looking at the width to the height ratio before I commit to something that's a volumetric. The proportions are really important because the viewer has to believe your vision as you're putting it together. Another nice little trick here to kind of keep in mind is the fact that even though one leg's a little foreshortened, the other one is straight up and down, the proportions across them really aren't that different. So when you look at the height to width ratio, whether it's up where it hits the hip or down by the kneecap, it's not that much different than the other one. And again, that's a broad general overall rule, but at the same time, it really helps you kind of keep an eye on the relationship between all the forms so they don't get totally out of whack. Now, pose is different, models are different, angles are different, but again, it's a great organizing principle to kind of keep in mind. So once again, I need a little vacation from all that math and proportion and form, regimental sort of rules. I just go into the chair, kind of swing a pencil around a little bit, see again how it relates to the figure and to keep the proportions right. One thing about when you're drawing a figure that's foreshortened or sitting on a chair, you have to make sure the chair's in the right proportion and the legs are gonna be completely out of whack and not work, they'll either be too short or too long. So use that chair as a proportional measuring device. Also, as you watch me, you'll see that I take those diagonal axis lines of the chair points and then apply them into the body to see, to map out uh, the right proportions of that chair, make sure the planes on the seat are right and on the ground plane are right. I'm somewhat happy with my proportions, so now I'm gonna move on to the main event and show how to put those simple forms, those overlapping forms on top of your design. So as you bring out this can to represent the volumes that I'm going to be applying to the measurements, you'll see that I swing the can in direction of the forms that it's attached to. There's the upper leg, here's the lower leg, here's the torso, the other arm, and then the left leg, the left vertical leg. And what you may notice is that as you swing the can more towards you, the top lips opens up more. The form goes farther away from you. The perspective changes. It gets smaller. So now let's put theory to practice. So what I'm doing now is just sort of very lightly uh, boxing in these forms, looking for the overlaps, looking for the proportions, uh, looking at the size of the ellipses and how much I can see or can't see. As I'm drawing, you can see that I'm not really drawing a lot of rounded outside contour lines. That it, I'm using this, again, to fit my design. I'm checking the basic proportions. So yes, the top of that lower leg is going to get wider, and there'll be more uh, form added to the upper part of the upper leg. But not at this point. Is I'm just trying to get my proportions all set up to execute on it later. So you take this methodology into a classroom or a workshop, and even if you're working on quick gesture drawings, this is an organizing principle that's gonna help keep it all together and allow you to understand foreshortening and where the overlaps are. At this point, reference the diagram to the left, and you can see that I'm combining all that anatomical information into simple form, again, to make it more understandable. 
So as I start to build more of the curves and put the line and the anatomy in, it'll work with my basic design. Basic structural design that you can build, subtract, add to it as you go along. It makes the whole process of figure drawing a lot more understandable and a lot more sculptural. So it allows you to change and move and reconsider things uh, without the whole drawing falling apart and without being too nerve-wracking. Keeping the drawing fluid and gestured role is really important to me as I put this together, even though it's structural. So as I put this together, you might notice that I move my lines around a lot. I don't stick onto one spot because, again, I'm looking at the entire drawing, the entire figure as an overall design to get the eye to move around in rather than get stuck in one certain spot, unless I want that to be a focal point. Pulling back and looking at the whole design, getting away from drawing the sections of the body, uh, is I'm making sure that the whole image holds together. Now again, the lines are a little bit hard because I've been going over and over and over because of the demonstration part of the drawing. But you can see how it sort of really sculpturally holds together, addresses the chair, leans on the chair, and goes back in space. So at this point right now, I'm sort of uh, pumping up the overlaps and reinforcing the more rounded and square forms. So at this last pass, this last viewing of the figure, what I'm doing is showing the major overlaps uh, where things really come together and how they're organizing. Again, you get a good idea of the spatial relationship between all the pieces. Ultimately, that's a really important concept when you're looking at figure drawings, that you want to get the idea that not only what the figure is doing, but how their forms recede or come at you in space. So it creates a more structural, more sculptural form. Using this technique affords you a really good way of creating a scaffolding for the rest of your drawing. When you do put that more organic uh, anatomical information onto it, it will read in relationship to the bigger forms and not fall apart into little teeny tiny details. And once again, thank you very much for watching the video and feel free please to go into the other ones and take a look. There's animal drawing, more portrait drawing, uh, and there's also this part one of this as well as other ones connected in with my Otis College account as well. Thank you. See you later. Bye.